Thank you so much for coming. It's my uh, honor and pleasure to host this morning the Venerable Rubina Curtin. Rubina has been a Tibetan Buddhist nun for over 30 years, and uh, during that time is well reputed for the uh, <laughs> unique and very impacting and deep uh, style with which she teaches. I believe that you will find this talk to be uh, engaging and, and enlightening and fun and all of the best things that you can do at work on a Friday morning. So. Uh, Rubina is working with a group called the, or it was actually the executive director of the Liberation Prison, Prison Project, which has uh, sort of provided a spiritual foundation for more than 15,000 prisoners worldwide. And um, this is a very big undertaking and has a, a staff, and staff requires, you know, funding. So to help with that uh, uh, and to help draw funds to the Liberation Prison Project, Rubina is. Uh, leading a conference in San Francisco coming up soon, at which our very own uh, Chade Meng Tan will be speaking, our jolly good fellow. Um, the goal of this conference is to, of course, bring about happiness in its causes and to cut suffering in its causes. Um, and one of the other benefits that it will have will be to support the Liberation Prison Project financially. Um, Robina is here to give a talk this morning about how to be your own therapist. And uh, without any further ado, I will turn it over to her. Thank you, Tom. <laughs> Happy to be here, everybody. Thank you very much for having me. Uh, well, first of all, here I am, dressed as a Buddhist nun. So we straight away go into our religious mode, don't we? And we think it's all about religion and therefore believing things. Well, Buddha's not like that. So for a start, the kind of thinking cap you put on when you think science, when you think numbers, you put that same hat on, please. Don't bring your religious hat in here. Bring your intelligent hat. Because I'm not joking to say that actually Buddha um, is more similar to, say, Einstein in the sense that Buddha is not a creator. He doesn't speculate. No one revealed anything to him. He, doesn't, he didn't have visions of things. He didn't kind of make things up. And therefore, there's nothing to believe. It's actually true to say that Buddha you know, is a person, like a scientist, as we would call it, who from his own experience has found certain things to be so. So what he deals with primarily is the human mind. So from that perspective, you could say he's a psychologist. I mean, obviously, he didn't use that word then. He didn't speak Greek, did he? He spoke Hindi or Pali or whatever it was. But actually, Buddha deals with the mind. That's his expertise. And that is finally the essence of what Buddhism is, you know. So yes, indeed, I'm a Buddhist nun. And if you go to Tibetan Buddhist places, you won't get a sense of its being psychological. What you're going to see is religion, pictures and holy things and nuns and monks and the, the, the trappings of religion. But what's interesting about Buddhism over the centuries is that there's no contradiction you know, for, Buddhist, for Buddhist culture. There's no contradiction between what we call spiritual and what is called proving things and um, using your intelligence you know, or philosophy, these things. And in, frankly, that's what actually appealed to me enormously. I was brought up a Catholic. And I think in my own life, the thing that really drove me was my wish. I mean, it sounds awfully noble, but I'm saying it, my wish for truth. So that drove me to sort of philosophical approaches, always looking for the big view, always wanting to know why and what, you know. So, you know, first being a bit of an old hippie and then kind of a revolutionary lefty and then feminist politics and whatever, always looking for why things were. And I found it enormously appealing, this Buddhist idea, first that, you know, Buddha didn't, nobody created you, including your mother and the father, that, you know, but, but, but the crucial thing about Buddhism is that, uh, as I said, Buddha presents things about how he has seen things. And then what's interesting in the Buddhist view is it's a process of verification. But the point of that is not just to get a head full of knowledge, that, that verification of something also brings along with it the experiential result. So there's this key relationship in Buddhism, therefore, between so-called wisdom and happiness. So the Buddha's deal really is that, first of all, we have this mind, this consciousness. These words are used synonymously. And so, of course, the way to listen to Buddhism, because he's not a creator, you take it as a hypothesis. You don't try to squeeze it inside your head and believe it or reject it. You take it as a hypothesis, which is a very reasonable person's approach to any knowledge. So the Buddha's deal is Buddha's asserting that consciousness is not physical for a start. Second, it's not created by anybody. And that's a big shock, because if we're materialists, as far as we're concerned, our mummy and daddy created us. And if we're religious, then God created us. But the Buddha's got a kind of third approach. And he would say, we don't need creating. Why we need a creator, he doesn't know. 
But he is asserting that consciousness, and you just take this as your, you know, as a as a thing to run with. It's your it's this river of mental moments, all your thoughts, feelings, unconscious, subconscious, instinct, intuition, the entire spectrum of your inner being. This is your consciousness. So think of it as like a river of mental moments. And you know very well, if you had perfect memory, you could track it all back to yesterday without a single second missing. You could track it back to the day before. And if it existed the day before, you know you have to track it back to the day before, and so on and so forth, you know? So you can get back to the first second of conception. So here is this hypothesis. The Buddha's view would be that the second before conception, you know, you, your egg and sperm were in your mummy and daddy's body, minding their own business. God has nothing to do with it, nor Buddha. But your consciousness is its own entity and you can track it back and back. So that'll do for that concept right there. But the key thing is to see the experiential implication of this, which is, which is what gets us to this business of being your own therapist, you know, which is a very tasty way of seeing what a person who is living with Buddhism in their lives is attempting to do. Because the Buddha's deal is that your mind is yours. No one gave it to you. It's a very bizarre concept, kind of quite schizophrenic idea in Buddhism that someone else kind of created us plonked us on this earth and said, okay, now get along with it, you know, and, and I mean, the Buddha would say that what's in my mind is mine, my anger, my love, my intelligence, my kindness, my compassion, my tendencies are mine. So this simple, one of the implications of this idea of continuity of consciousness, and I won't go too far into that now, it doesn't need, just take it as your hypothesis. It's inevitable, it's inexorable that therefore what's inside your mind is yours and you're responsible for it. Not in a guilty sense. There's no dualistic idea in Buddhism about guilt and blame and, and sort of that kind of idea. What's in there is yours. He would say, the Buddha would say, it's, you're not stuck with it. I mean, just the last 20 years, these amazing um, discussions that have been going on between the, the Dalai Lama and all the marvelous minds in the, from the Tibetan, Tibetan monastic um, tradition, and with these, the best brains in the West, you know, and, and some of the, as one scientist recently said, one of the greatest findings of the 20th century is the idea of neuroplasticity. Well, with respect, Buddha could have told you that two and a half thousand years ago. I'm just happy we're catching up with Buddha, that's all, you know. But guess what? We're not stuck with what we're born with. This is an assumption in all of Buddha's view of the universe, you know, and it's something that's assumed in a person who is a Buddhist in their practice. And it's quite empowering. Because if you look at how we suffer in daily life, it's this sense of kind of hopelessness. I'm angry, I'm depressed, I'm no good, I can't do this. We have this very limited kind of instinctive sense of what we think we are. We're kind of, I didn't ask to get born, it's not my fault, what can I do about it? I think you look inside ourselves, this is what holds us back, you know. But what, it, it, taking on this Buddhist idea and learning to use it as your basis in your life, I can tell you from my own experience, it's unbelievably empowering that yes, whatever's in there is there. Take responsibility, see it, don't pretend it's not there. The hopelessness, the fear, the jealousy, the depression, you know, the low self-esteem, the wanting to kill yourself, wanting to kill others, blame, whatever you want to call it. It's all there. And the, and the idea of being your own therapist is to become intimately, and I mean intimately familiar with this stuff. Not just to get more guilty, but the, we all know that when you find what the problem is, you then, that indicates the solution, doesn't it? If you can't locate the problem, you'll never find the solution. So this is the basis, you know, in this nice packaging, say, in the Buddhist teachings called the Four Noble Truths, the context here is suffering. And so the third one is where Buddha's really asserting, and again, you take this as your hypothesis, that every living being necessarily possesses this phenomenal potential to be free of what we would call suffering, what we would call the limitations, what we would, you know, all the miserable stuff. And the flip side of that is we have the potential to grow the good stuff. So looking in a very simple way at kind of a, the Buddhist model of the mind, you know, and it's deceptively simple actually, we make it awfully complicated in the West, you know, with ADID and buy this and whatever it is, you know. But the Buddha puts, put, talks about the mind in terms of we've got positive qualities, which are those that necessarily bring us happiness and cause us to benefit others, that feel harmonious, that feel spacious, that feel relaxed. And then you've got the neurotic negative qualities that necessarily cause you suffering, necessarily and that cause you to harm others and are disharmonious and fractured and miserable and fearful and neurotic in their nature, you know. So the, the marvellous point the Buddha is making, and this is, not, this is completely flying in the face of all the assumptions of all our models of the mind in the West, that these do not have equal status. You know, if we think of what, a, what we think of a person, you define the parts of a person in our materialist world. We would say that a reasonable person, you know, has a, well, maybe, you know, a couple of legs, a nose, a couple of eyes in roughly the right place. 
plus some love, some kindness, some intelligence, some depression. And as long as they're reasonably balanced, then you're an okay person. Well, Buddha's view, his kind of baseline, if you like, when it sounds insane, is really perfection. He would say that mind at its core is pure. And again, this stuff, you don't believe it. I'm stating it, but then a person who's interested, you go into this, you, you get your inferential kind of information and you work it through in your own mind. You process it to see the logic of it, to find the truth of it. And as the Dalai Lama points out again and again, if you can prove from your own direct experience that the Buddha's wrong, you must reject him. So the Buddha's picture, the Buddha's view is that the, the positive states of mind are at the core of our being. They are the basis of who we are and therefore can be grown for our sake and the sake of others in this universe, you know. It's a reasonable practical issue, not like a, you must do it because God said so. There's no concept like that in Buddhism. It's, a, it's an experiential practical issue. And then he says, therefore, the stuff that he would call the negative, which he says is the basis of our neurosis and our misery and our low self-esteem and all the rest, is actually not at the core of our being. This is quite a shocker because there's a deep assumption, as I said, in all our models of the mind in the West, that it is at the core of our being. That, in fact, you'd actually think you're an unnatural person if you didn't have depression or anger. We think now we're unnatural when it's very extreme. But the Buddha would say having any of it, is unnatural in the sense that it doesn't belong, in the sense that it's there, loud and clear, look at your life, but that we can transform it, we can change it. And I'm not talking holy here. Do not hear this stuff of holy. Hear this as intelligent, practical, doable stuff. And I can't stress this enough, you know, because we have these absolutely knee-jerk reactions. The moment we hear about spiritual, Buddhist, nun, meditation, we kind of lose our common sense. We think we have to put our thinking cap off. Well, mistake. Keep it on, you know. And that's, what, for myself personally, what I absolutely delight in, in this tradition of the Dalai Lama that, that happens to be in the Tibetan, mon you know, this monastic, philosophical monastic tradition, the last thousand, twelve hundred years. I found it in my own life enormously appealing, you know. You don't chuck out your intelligence. There's no contradiction between heart and intelligence in the Buddha's view. There's this nice analogy that a, that a bird needs two wings, wisdom and compassion. And the wisdom wing, you could say, is all this work of being your own analyst, knowing yourself intimately, precisely, clearly, using the same level of depth of analysis and intelligence and clarity that we know we need to employ in what we call science. You know, that's the kind of intelligence you need to really know your own mind using these very marvelous techniques that have been around for th more than a thousand years, several thousand years, pre-Buddha. He took these techniques from the Hindus, you know, I mean, they're happy to share. These so-called concentration techniques, they're unbelievably practical psychological techniques, the likes of which we haven't even begun to tap in our materialist world. And this is just a practical fact, you know. Don't think of them as religious. This is really a disservice to ourselves and others. You really, to do these techniques well, you need phenomenal discipline, phenomenal intelligence, phenomenal will, and real long-term patience, you know. And the, and the result of these, I mean, communists could do them. They're not religious in their nature, these practical techniques called concentration meditation. But again, we've got these cliched ideas that it's all to do with getting a nice feeling and being mindful. Well, excuse me, you know, thieves need mindfulness. There's nothing holy about mindfulness, okay? You can't make a cake without being mindful, but you can't shoot somebody without being mindful either. So we've really got to quit this kind of wishy-washy nonsense about spiritual. I really can't stand it, you know. <laughs> you get my point, okay? I'm a Buddhist nun, I don't deny. Whatever. But d these misconceptions we have about spiritual, you know, we make this huge dis sort of dichotomy in our own lives between pleasure and, and thinking and intelligence and science, and then, and then you, you, you're spiritual on the other side. There is no contradiction, you know, there is no contradiction. The, the essence of the Buddhist one really is this one of. Um, can you turn me around? I can't do it. I'm getting more and more on this side. Just whiz me around. That's it. <laughs> Um, it's just going to go to the left, whatever I can do. I can't help it. <laughs> Give me a chair. To put. No, don't, don't worry. I'll be right. So, okay, so let's look at the contents a little bit of this mind of ours. The names of these so-called positive qualities and the names of these so-called negative ones. And again, don't hear this as judgment. It's, just a, it's a practical issue. We're trying to identify problems. Because let's face it, we all want happiness, you know. And do your market research just in this room. You're going to get 100% agreement. People want happiness, don't want suffering. You ask the dogs and the giraffe, you look at their behavior, you're going to see what they want the same, you know. 
So then the Buddha's deal is, okay, that's, that's practical, a good start. So let's look at what happiness is. How does he define it? And therefore, what are the obstacles to it? And they're the things you work on, you know? You want to be healthy? You've got some suffering? You find out what the problem is? You find the alternative? You solve the problem. It's practical. So Buddha's view of happiness is actually very, is very simple. We make it complicated. We think of it as like a needle in a haystack that you're trying to search for because we believe instinctively, and this is the materialist view, again, don't be kind of, it's not moralistic, it's practical. We think of it as something you've got to find. So we think of it in external terms. The job, the body, the boyfriend, the dollars, the shape, the sound, the smell. Well, you know, no problem. As many boyfriends as you like, as much, many dollars as you like, no, no problem there. All the Buddha's saying is if you think that you'll get happy feelings from it, you're mistaken. You might get some, but they won't last. So for him, it's real simple. This idea of happiness, if you think about it again, what we think it is, is what you get when you get what you want. And that drives us. This is primordial in us. This is deeply instinctive within us. And he is finding fault with it. He says it's just not practical. It doesn't work. But he says happiness is, it's real simple. It's what you get when you give up the neuroses. It's in that sense it's inside. It's, it's a practical thing. In other words, the extent to which we are caught up at any given moment in low self-esteem, depression, anger, jealousy, you name it, we all know those words and they're under the negative heading. We all know them. The extent to which we're caught up in those is the extent to which we suffer, therefore are not happy. The extent to which we are not caught up in those and therefore the extent to which we're involved in kind of, you know, connecting with others, empathy, being harmonious, forgiving, it's a struggle, but they're the positive qualities. The extent to which they're prevalent in our minds at any given moment is the extent to which we're happy. It's an incredibly simple little recipe in Buddhist terms. We think it is what you get when you get what you want. He says it's what you get when you give up the neuroses, which is the one, of, so the technique is learning to know your mind, be your own therapist. Yes, indeed, using these so-called mindfulness techniques, they're practical psychological techniques to help you focus your mind. The reason you want to focus your mind, because we can see from the second we wake up until the second we go to sleep, it's running 4,000 miles an hour in every imaginable direction with zero control. And we in our culture assume that's normal. Well, Buddha says it's a mental illness. And he's got techniques to help us steady it. And don't think about calming it. That's kind of, you get this sort of an idea of a person with a silly grin on their face. <laughs> a calm mind can be a busy mind, okay? And if you think about it, what causes the problems isn't a busy mind. It's when the, when it's the busy mind is caught up in fear about yourself and worried what people think about you and am I good enough and I'm too fat and I'm too thin and depression and jealousy and anxiety and all the rest. That's the stuff that causes the misery. If you're full of thoughts about being useful to others all day and being content with yourself, well, please go for it, you know. You don't have a problem, believe me. So we've got to be very precise about this. Sure, in time, as we progress, in the development of this mind of ours, this ongoing job of being your own therapist. We all know practice makes perfect. That as you progress, you can still have a busy mind. I have a busy mind, believe me, you can hear it. <laughs> but that's okay, you know, I'm not trying to say I'm so holy. But I know from the very beginning, when I first wanted something spiritual, it was a very interesting procedure I went through. You know, I'd been a kind of a hippie and a communist and a feminist, all this stuff, looking for truth, looking for the answers to why the world was the way it was. And then I bumped into these Tibetan Buddhists when I heard the word meditation, I thought, how boring, you know. I had no idea. what I couldn't care. I just knew I had this attraction to this kind of, I wanted to get a view of the universe. So, you know, a philosophical approach, a way to see how the world is and put it all, put the, you know, put the two and two together. So I remember having this very cliched idea about what I was supposed to be and I kind of these vague notions of being mindful and peaceful and all this stuff. So I thought I had to go more slowly or something. And I remember a friend of mine, she held my hand and she said, Rabina, what's happened? You've lost your energy. And I got this strong sense that what I was doing, which is very common when we start a spiritual practice, it kind of, I was wearing this, this inauthentic idea of spiritual, like a cloak. It was, it was artificial. It was not authentic. And I had this strong sense, and this is what I've gotten from Buddhism, for myself and meeting these Tibetans. I mean, people love the Dalai Lama because he actually says he doesn't know sometimes. He just says, I don't know, when you ask him a question, you know. People like very much this kind of authenticity. I think that's why they like Sarah Palin, isn't it? <laughs> she did a good job last night, I thought. She kind of seems authentic, you know. So the thing was, I realized, stop trying to be something I'm not. Be honest about what I am, but then slowly, slowly, learn to be authentic. 
see what you are, take, look at your qualities, take responsibility for them, and then know you're, you're a work in progress. As one Tibetan Lama said, we can mould our minds, our thoughts and feelings into any shape we like, you know. And this is the thing here, the level at which I'm discussing here, the level of practice, based upon these really marvellous techniques where you can learn to focus your mind, you then use the skill of, cog of, of this, um, really a process of cognitive therapy. And I'm really not kidding. Buddha is a master cognitive therapist. You learn more and more clearly, literally, to hear the millions of voices inside there that now are racing, like I said, out of control all day, every day. But it is possible, with more and more focus, and that just needs practice, to see more deeply, to listen more deeply, to be more precise, and then slowly being able to distinguish between the neurotic voices and the positive ones. Truly, that's it, you know. The, the basis of all our neurotic ones, this is one way of saying about it in Buddhism, the basis of the neurotic voices, the, the, the fearful ones, the angry ones, the jealous, the depression, is, the, is a neurotic sense of self, of I. You think about it, you know, if Monica and I are sitting there having a very friendly conversation, I'm listening to her and she's listening to me and I crack her, you know, I laugh at her jokes and she laughs at mine. You think about this carefully when it's very easy going. There's no real vivid sense of I this, I am listening to Monica. You're kind of connected to her. There's a sense of interdependence, isn't there? There's a sense of we. Now you watch what happens when you start to argue. That we is cut in half right there. So when the things were going nicely, you could say that the positive qualities of, of connectedness, and they are, that's really their nature, there's a sense of connectedness. The unhappy eye is kind of quiet like a sleeping lion. And there's a sense, of, a sense of another, a sense of connected to other there. But then when that's cut, you kind of revert back into yourself and the eye rises loudly and you're panicking and your heart's beating and the blood's racing and she did this and I said that, it's not fair, poor me this. That's the voice the eye, the neurotic eye, behind all the unhappy states of mind. That's their character. So it's a bit depressing if you think that you're born with this and you can't change it. Now, why do we want to go kill ourselves, you know? So even to think, wow, that's interesting, maybe it's possible. Maybe what Buddha says, it's possible. That they're not at the core of my being. That I can learn to look into these and deconstruct them and hear the voices and unpack them and slowly, cognitively change myself. This is the process I'm talking about here. There are many kinds of techniques. There's a whole tool, you know, tool kit of, of, kit of, of tools. As Paulson said recently about the economy. Did you hear him say that? I read every paper in the world, I tell you. I'm a complete junkie for newspapers. So there's a whole part, there's a big toolkit of many kinds of things. The one I'm talking here, which I find eminently practical for us in the West, with all our geniuses, genius minds working ten times the pace of most people's, don't try to hold yourself back. Love the fact that you've got a brilliant mind, that you're a real thinker. This is the, this is the technique, this is the tool that you can use to be your own therapist, to use this cognitive process, to deconstruct your own stuff. Okay, alongside that intelligence, you need some you know, integrity, you need humility, you need the wish to look at yourself, you need the will to want to, the ability and the wish to want to go beyond blame and hurt. That alongside this intelligence, that's a marvellous packaging, I tell you. That's the stuff that we need. Intelligence on its own is a disaster. You can still be an infantile at the age of 90, even if you're a genius, you know. So the emotional intelligence is what we need to get. And the lack of emotional intelligence is what we have when we have anger and jealousy and fear and attachment, because they're these totally self-centered, unhappy, miserable states of mind. So the, the first, in the wisdom wing talk in Buddhism, it's a question of knowing yourself well, taking responsibility, but on the basis of the fact that you can change, not, oh, I'm so guilty, I'm so bad. Not that at all, which is the knee-jerk reaction we tend to have when we point out problems in ourselves. That's not the attitude here. It's a courageous attitude. That you say, okay, I am jealous, I get depressed, I am this, I am that. What a drag. It's breaking my heart. So you've got to have compassion for yourself, really which is a brand new idea for us. We love to hate ourselves. So this wisdom wing is on the one side, is on the basis of the fact that you've got this marvelous potential, emotional, intelligent potential to develop your human qualities. More strongly you can kind of uh, identify with your positive potential, the more you have the courage, don't you, to see the things that are holding you back. But to, the crucial one for me is, if we take one thing from this room, I can change. 
It sounds so simple, it's almost embarrassing. But you check the major level at which we suffer when things are going bad. We cannot see the light at the end of the tunnel. This is why we despair. Because instinctively, we're identifying I with that junk. So the key thing I'm saying here is we have the junk. Don't pretend we haven't. But it's not at the core of your being. That's all. It's sort of like you've got this big, ugly scar on your, on your arm, and you think it's, it can't be removed. So, of course, you want to hide it. You feel depressed. You identify with it. But one day you discover, you know, you can remove it slowly. Well, there it is. It's still there, but you feel more hopeful now because you know it's not at the core of your being. It's something like this. It's quite profound, actually. So for me, the, the thing we need badly in our culture, you know, when the Dalai Lama heard about the, the level of low self-esteem in our culture, he was quite sad. He said, that's a mental illness. They don't even have a concept like that among Tibetans, you know. What do you mean low self-esteem? How can you hate yourself, they say. They think it's a shocking thing to say. But we have bucket loads of it. And even though we might be getting buckets of dollars and have brilliant jobs and be praised and loved by everybody, look at the torture inside our hearts, you know. So we might have this stuff, but the miracle is, the key is, and start with a hypothesis. Don't just blindly believe it. You can't begin to investigate something unless you hypothesize it. If you never think it's possible, you won't open the door to it. You've got to think it's possible. And then you've got to work with it and find out. Test for yourself, you know. This is the approach. So well, I think you can ask me some questions now. Why not? You've actually got an hour's worth in half an hour because I talk fast. <laughs> so there's an advantage. So really, ask me some questions. Get the mic here. Yeah. Please. Oops. Okay, so thank you so much for coming and taking Pleasure. this talk. Pleasure. Thanks for having me. So since it's pretty pointless to pursue a job and the girlfriend and the dollars and the car, wouldn't the most practical thing for us to be to just you know, take care of a little bit of shelter and food and spend all the time How in revolting. contemplation? How I couldn't stand a life like that. No, you're ridiculous. <laughs> There's nothing wrong with millions of dollars and jobs and girlfriends and gorgeous things. No, 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 you're chucking the baby out with the bathwater. You went too far. You became kind of nihilistic. No, that's not the point. You can have your cake and eat it too, sweetheart. And I'm really serious here. The Buddha makes this enormous distinction between the thing itself and your interpretation of it. And what he is describing here, the problem is our interpretation of the girlfriend of the money. If you put all your eggs in those baskets, believing primordially that having them equals happiness, he says that's when you'll be disappointed because you just got the wrong recipe. So he doesn't say give them up. He says change your way of interpreting them. So the wisdom wing approach would be you'd see that happiness is, de is dependent upon you changing, getting rid of your neurotic attachment, getting rid of all your craving for people to love you, getting, I mean, I'm talking about the neurotic side here, the craving for people to approve of you and think you're fantastic and the dollars in the bank. The neurotic dependence on that stuff is what I am talking about, not the stuff itself. Because look at our world. You know, if you're in Tibetan culture a thousand years ago, you'd live like that. Excuse me, you'd be chucked into prison if you live like this. Homeless people live like this, and they're the scum of the earth, aren't they? So that's not the answer. We're in this world of abundance and money and things and color and shapes and music and sounds. It's, a, it's kind of a sophisticated view. The first level is maybe you back away for a while, while you go into retreat mode, you know? But eventually, with skill, you can have your cake and eat it too. It's giving up the neurotic attitude towards the things, not the things themselves. That's a major, major point. Makes sense, doesn't it? Okay. So to kind of continue in the same vein, um, I've heard of the concept of pain without suffering. I guess what I'm wondering about is, I, I feel like it's, I feel like I understand or it's not that hard for me to apply the kind of thinking that you're talking yes. about to an mm -hmm. awful lot of day-to-day -day issues are even pretty big issues sure. but if you're confronted for instance with the death of a loved one I or see. these larger yeah. things how does that kind of fit into this I framework? Hear what exactly you know I mean one of the ways Buddha's talking is that we in our minds we have deep in the bones of our being so intuitively because of enormous amount of habit, a series, layers upon layers upon layers of assumptions about how things are and how we think they should be. We, so much so that we don't even notice. So the one that's being attacked right here, in terms of a neurotic state of mind, which is why we suffer, is a deep assumption that somehow I shouldn't change, 
that loved ones shouldn't die, that jobs shouldn't go, that I shouldn't get the sack, that bad things shouldn't happen. I mean, you're getting my point here. Yeah. If we look at life, we, if we did some market research again, we're going to see it is normal that people die. It's normal that people lose jobs. It's normal these things happen. But everything in us desperately tr thinks, try to avert it because somehow it's a mistake. So the, the idea here is the way they talk in Buddhism, one of the first steps is to recognize everything changes. I mean, it's hardly rocket science, but it's deep in our bones. In other words, if I've got this lovely cup that came from my grandmother, I've been investing in this cup a lot of energy, aren't I? So there's an assumption in my mind, the more I'm attached to it, the more I believe it won't break. So when it does, I'm devastated. Why are you suffering, Rabina? Oh, my beautiful cup broke. No, 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 the Buddha says you're suffering, not because it broke, because that's its nature, but because you really believed it shouldn't and wouldn't. So it's not, it sounds a bit sort of clinical, but because we have strong connections with certain people, and that's just part of life, we therefore have the neurotic over-dependent attachment upon them, which is the cause of so much of the pain, which builds up this whole idea that they will always be in my life and I will never lose them and they will not die. We know intellectually they will, but there's no way we want to ever confront that. It sounds too depressing. So the extent to which we're not in touch with that simple reality that things change is the extent to which we suffer when it does. So it's getting in touch with that, which is quite deep inside us. So it doesn't mean you just, oh, well, when they die, you don't care. It doesn't mean you just become indifferent. I remember the Dalai Lama talking about when his mummy died. He was in tears. But at, when we've got a lot of neediness and attachment and over-dependent upon something in a neurotic sense, we might never heal that broken heart when our loved one dies. Because you understand my point. It's a real, the difference between the positive and the negative sides of us, it's really, really quite subtle to see them. They're very mixed together. So it doesn't mean, like his point is a perfect one, we chuck the baby out with the bathwater as soon as we hear we've got a happiness doesn't come from girlfriends. Well, as soon as we hear that we suffer because we're attached to our friends, we think, oh, well, we don't care when they die. No, 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 it's not like that. It's just that it won't be a neurotic eye-based thing. You'll heal more quickly, you'll miss them, and you'll be sad when you think about them, but it doesn't take your heart with you. You don't get destroyed, you know. You can heal quickly because you recognize this is part of life. It's a reality, you know. Yeah, that makes a great deal of sense. Um, I had a second question. Yeah, go on. People have the patience. Um, for those of us who are, you know, clearly novices and new to this, what do you think are some good gateways to learn more about Tibetan Buddhism here in the Bay Area? Well, I, you know, they have this nice saying in Buddhism that everything exists on the tip of the wish. So the first, it's sort of obvious, but the first step in anything is the thought. So my walking out this door, believe me, my legs won't take me unless my mind decides. I'd be very surprised if my mind says I want to sit here and my legs take me out the door. So the same with going to a Buddhist centre, you know. Your legs will walk there, your finger will point there, you'll click on it if your mind wants it. So the first step is to want it. And I know I'm not trying to sound smart here, I'm really meaning it seriously. If we want something, you open the door to it in your mind and you make this aspiration. Okay, I like this, let's see. Because there's buckets, loads of stuff available. But then if you do start to search, Get rid of all these emotional nonsense about religion, you know, and you walk into some place and someone makes you all excited and you go, oh, far out, amazing, they're so holy. Be very careful. Do your due diligence. Check up because there are a lot of wackos around, you know. Sure. Like you do your due diligence when it comes to even just anything. Sure. Definitely do it with a spiritual practice. Go down. Do your research. Check things up. Listen carefully. They say check the teachers. Check the steps. Use your intelligence. Use your common sense. And it'll unfold. It'll come. If you've got the connection with it, you'll, all the doors will be there for you to walk into, you know. Thank you so Got much. Got to start in your mind, though. That impermanence one, I want to just tell you something. When I read Vanity, one story in Vanity Fair a few years ago, I told you I read every magazine in existence, I read this wonderful interview with Tom and, Nic Tom and Nicole when they were together, right? And Nicole said, this is very, very kind of the point I'm making, at the end of the interview, she said, we will be together until we're 80. And we understand that. We all feel that way. When you're in love with a person, you can't imagine that he might leave you. This is why it's so devastating. But then she covered herself and said, and of course, if something does change, it will be devastating. So th the point the Buddha's making is, you've got this close connection with somebody, whether it's your mother or your lover, you know, but what this nonsense in our mind does is glom onto it all this concept of now it's forever. That's why when things go down and you're depressed, you want to kill yourself because you can't see that that will change too. So whatever the status quo is, we grasp onto it as that's it forever. We do it all the time even though we're so stupid, you know. We can see it's stupid because we know from experience things change. To say that, oh, I might die tomorrow, every one of us in this room will think that's hysterical. Now you do your market research within a hundred mile radius. You're going to find a lot of people who believe when they went to bed they're going to wake up in the morning, didn't. 
We don't do that kind of market research, you know. We don't want to. But it's a fact. You prove it. Buddha's right. People die, you know. But we don't want to think it. Kind of, you understand. And it sounds a cute kind of idea, but it's, the implications are quite profound, actually. So the Buddha's deal is the more we're in touch with reality at whatever level, that's his key thing, actually. That's what he means by wisdom. Because he's saying, okay, this is an interesting point, actually. I'll get another question in a second. The two, he says there are two main characteristics these neurotic states of mind have. One is, and that's fairly evident, they are really disturbing. They are painful. They are just the having of them is suffering right there. But the other one is fascinating, and this is where it needs really looking when you study Buddhist psychology in more depth. The other characteristic is that they're delusional. Now, if you were accused of being delusional, you'd be very offended. But that he uses this word, delusion, for these unhappy states of mind. Meaning, the extent to which I'm caught up in attachment to somebody, or a chocolate cake, or my own sense of self, is the extent to which I'm not in touch with the reality of things. I'm kind of, as one Tibetan Lama said, you, these delusions, these neuroses, decorate on top of what is already there, layers upon layers of characteristics that just aren't there. We over-exaggerate, you know. So if you have a version for George Bush, let's say, and I, I hear that people do, <laughs> you really, he appears ugly to you, doesn't he? You really believe he's ugly. You don't say, well, yes, there's this human being there, and I know I have all this anger in my mind, and that causes me, that causes him him to appear ugly to me, but I'm sure there must be other qualities there as well. You do not do that. You go, he is this, and you believe what you're thinking. Well, you know, Condi likes him. She sees a nice guy there. When you see a person you're attached to, you don't say, oh yes, it's just my attachment making up this ridiculous story. He's really a regular guy, you know. He farts in the toilet in the morning and all these things. <laughs> no, no, you don't say that. You say he is what you think he is. These delusions, and this is quite primordial as well, the more we look into our minds, the more we see this characteristic. They make up a story, and then we believe that story. And this is the major way the Buddha's talking about how come we suffer, you know. And this whole deconstructing of our mind, this cognitive therapy I'm talking about, is very real at this level, you know. And being so intelligent, we'd be, we're brilliant at it. We're really, this is the style that we really like, you know. Yeah. Go on. Here we go. Just oh, you, darling. You, you want to say? Okay, thanks. Please. So um, I've been exploring some of this. A bit closer little... to the mic, sweetheart. <laughs> I've been exploring this for a little while, and um, when I first started hearing about you know anger and delusion, my instinct was to, well, if I felt angry, I shouldn't. So I'm not going to. That's exactly what's what we do. Isn't and it? and That's so that right. wasn't helpful, right? Not helpful and, at all. So now I'm at the stage where okay, I'm angry, I'm going to deconstruct, and I'm going to feel it. it. There you go, Donald. But then what happens after that? Well, sweetheart, listen, okay, you're doing it at the level of feeling, but that's still quite gross. You've, what's fascinating about this approach to the mind? Okay, let's say we have some people in this room, no doubt, who I, as a little girl, would have called a passive-aggressive. Then I'm a person who ain't a passive-aggressive, believe me. I'm an active-aggressive, all right? <laughs> Now, I knew as a little girl, because I was always the one that copped the trouble, I knew the ones who were really looking sweet. I knew they were angry inside. <laughs> so you get my point here. So what I'm trying to get at is this. Let's say you're one of the quiet people and you, you don't express anger. So if, but you know in your mind you've got angry thoughts. Wouldn't you agree with that? So if you wrote those down and, then I, and somebody had to just put the MP3 player on me, well, I wouldn't have to write them down, then you transcribe them. You're going to have two bits of paper one from a quiet person who doesn't express through her mouth and one with a loud person who does. But you're not going to see the difference, are you? They're both a bunch of thoughts, aren't they? That's where anger actually is. Okay, my anger harms others because I do verbal, you know? But the real thing you're trying to get into is to start to look beyond the feelings, darling. That's just your body. To get to see the actual construction of the thoughts of anger. And they are called, how dare you this? I hate you. And that's the part that's hard to hear because it's so feeling level and it's so physical for us and so deep down. We can't get to the point of deconstructing the thoughts. Well, sweetheart, if you have a series of misconceptions in your mind, like if you say, I am wearing a blue sweater. If you say that about yourself, and we look there, and we can see that's a misconception, wouldn't you agree? What would you do about that? Change my mind. You'd change your mind, baby. That's right. 
That's as simple as that. It just is a lot longer to deconstruct the thought to say, I hate you and you are the cause of all my suffering. And I, and it, because it goes real subtle, real deep based upon layers and layers of assumptions. It's a very sophisticated process of deconstruction. But once you get your head around the fact that it is conceptual, and I'm not joking, I swear you're on the track of being a Buddhist then. Do, whether you call it so, I don't care. Who cares, you know? That's, what, that's where the change is, at the level of changing the way we think. But you've got to have long-term patience, honey. And you've got to be brave enough, and this is the scary part, to learn to love it. It's like you've got to learn to taste your own vomit and delight in it. And I'm really not joking here, because that's the scary part. So we know we're angry or depressed, whatever it might be. Then we hear Buddha says you shouldn't be. We go all oh, tut, 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 I'm a naughty girl. And then we add anger to the anger. We're angry about our anger. And we think that's being spiritual. Well, that's fundamentalism, you know. And look at the spiritual world. It's revolting. A bunch of maniacs, you know. That is not spiritual, darling. You've got to have the courage to know this is long, ancient, old stuff. You've got to have the courage to own it and the respect for yourself, to know that it does not define you. And then the willingness to want to get in there, dive in deep and work with it. Honestly, I'm not kidding. Okay, Buddha didn't talk like this. If you read Buddhist stuff, he doesn't talk like this. I'm talking like a Westerner, aren't I? But there's not a word here I'm saying that is not pure Buddhism. It's just there's a different cultural way of saying it, that's all. You've got, that's a major step to make. I am angry, I am jealous, but guess what? It ain't me and I can change, rather than the guilty nonsense. That's just self-destruction and it's appalling and that's not spiritual. Do you understand? There's a nice saying, again, we have, when we do this kind of practice in Buddhism, we, we, we say, we talk about, at the end of the day, you kind of check up, you know, and you regret. You kicked the dog at 11 o'clock and you killed your mummy at 12 o'clock and you stole the money at 1 o'clock, whatever. You check back on your day. But, you know, what we have right now is, oh, I did this and I did that, and then we go, and I'm a bad person. But no, you say, I did do it. But then you say, what can I do about it? That's the miracle. I remember Martin Luther King saying the same about anger, because this internal is like anger, but you're the object. So instead of, you know, what we do now is he did this and this, and then we say he this and how did that, we curse and swear, right? But no, you must point out fault. It is wrong to drop bombs. It is wrong to harm people. You see the fault, but then you say, like Martin Luther King said, now, what can I do about it? That's the action part. That's the responsible part. That's the grown-up one. The one that says I'm bad or he's bad is like taking no responsibility. It's like a little baby. And that's where, we sit, that's where we live, in this self-pity misery, you know? You understand? It's a major step, but you've got to catch that voice. Turn it around. It's up to you, darling. Who else? Yes. So I think you kind of answered my question, um, but I guess I've come at a place in my life where I've accepted that death is part of life and that there will be struggles and... Um, you know, pain for everyone. So how do you get to that next stage where you find happiness knowing that in part of just life. Question of, just a question of getting, quitting, getting used to it. And that's, I swear to you, is the experience I'm having this last 12 years working with people in prisons, you know. I mean, I didn't ask for it to happen. I didn't sort of think, now I'll go to prison, you know. I was editing a Buddhist magazine when I was living down in Santa Cruz, the magazine of the organization I'm part of. And we got this letter from this young Mexican guy. He was 18, he told me. He'd been in prison since he was 12. He'd been in gangs all his life, you know, from Los Angeles. He um, was in this prison called Pelican Bay, which is up just south of Oregon, and one of the main top security prisons in this state, and therefore this country, because this, this state's the best for prisons, you know. It's, a, it's the only growth industry in California, someone told me recently. Um, this guy, he'd been in this prison since, he's been in prison since he's 12. So and since that time, we've had letters from, we get letters, a thousand letters a month from people in prison now. We go to eight staff in San Francisco, 150 volunteers around the world. We've got office in Australia, we help people in Mongolia, Mexico, <coughs> Spain, Colombia. And we, mainly it's on the basis of getting letters. So about 1,000 a month. And so we've contact with easily 15,000, probably more, human beings in prisons, mainly in this country. So it's, it's just this stunning experiential example of exactly this point about how, as one lovely person said to me recently, how to find happiness where you don't expect it. So we think of happiness usually as a pleasant, joyful feeling. Okay, and that's nothing wrong. But the amazing thing is when we understand this attitude, you can learn, as one Tibetan Lama said it, to like problems like you like ice cream. And it sounds nuts. But the first step is to accepting the reality that death and change happens, that you can be thrown into prison, someone can wrongly accuse you, that you can get raped, that you can get murdered. I mean, life happens. 
there's another discussion about why, but there's no time for that here, you know, the Buddha's deal. But the facing of the reality of this is profound, actually. It means, okay, this is how it is. Now let's see what I can do about it. That's the one. The angry voice says, it shouldn't be this way. How dare it be this way? Why is it this way? It's wrong it's this way. As long as we have that interpretation of it, you will never, ever, ever be happy. But what I'm seeing about these, these people in prison, amazing examples. I'm not trying to make them all sound so holy, you know. Regular people, but the scum of the earth, but the bottom of our society. Most of them have been in drugs and violence and gangs and no family, no friends, no money. I mean, unbelievable lives, you know, these people I've been meeting over these years. But I can't describe to you the humility and the courage of so many of them. Life sentences, death row, turning themselves around, recognizing this is the reality. I'm in this shithole, excuse me. I will not get out alive, very likely. Now what can I do about it? Now let's see what I can, now let's interpret it in a different way. The Buddha's deal at the deepest wisdom level is nothing has an inherent nature as good or bad. That's a shock to us. This is the meaning of emptiness in Buddhism. It's quite a profound view, you know, that nothing is stuck in this or that. Things have a relative reality of good or bad. You can't deny it. But finally, it is how we interpret things. Finally, it's up to how we interpret. So we all know if you have a person who's very angry, everything will always look ugly. But another person who's more tolerant, they see the, they'll see the bright side. They'll see, well, we can do this, we can do that. It's because their mind is different. And I'm seeing this with people in prison, and for me, it is so humbling. I'm not in prison. I'd go crazy in some of these places, you know. They're living in these violent, insane asylums. And they're learning to become amazing human beings, and they're doing this job that I'm talking about. Nothing holy. Working on their minds, changing the way they interpret what's right in front of them. Seeing the good, seeing the possibility, seeing the opportunity. That's what I'm talking. We can all do that. But just that we're such junkies to get the nice tastes and smells and touches, we don't want to change our mind. Because we can change anything with the flick of a button now. You know, we're such geniuses. You understand? Makes sense, doesn't it? Yes. Um, how do the people who you work with in prison deal with, uh, I imagine there's probably a very big stigma attached to pursuing spirituality uh, in such a violent surrounding. Um, it, it, is physical violence ever an outcome of trying oh, to do this God, practice? Oh, God, you can't imagine. All, all the time. So I mean, there's one guy it? in Texas, this guy who's got AIDS, he's gay and he's on crutches, and he got brutalized and beaten up by some gangster recently, you know, and he has to be in protective custody. There's so many stories like this. But on the other side, there's many wonderful stories too. Yeah, I mean, some of them have to be keep it completely secret. They all share cells, because in California, the prisons are so overcrowded, it's just like a joke, you know, that they have to keep completely silent about it. Like, or they might have a roommate two inches above their head on the top bunk, you know, who, who purposely shouts and has the radio on and farts and does bad noises and abuses while the guy is trying to do his practice. So these people live with the most intense things, staring them in the face, you know, and they work with it. I mean, I'm blown out by it, you know. I'm really humbled by it. I'm the one telling what to do, and they do it. I can't believe it. <laughs> you know, really, it's incredible. So humbling what human beings are capable of when we are forced to. When it's the wake-up call. It's almost like their mantra, this is my wake-up call. You know? So, yeah, it's not that easy for many of them. Definitely. Especially if you've been in gangs. This is terrifying. I mean, the gang, I could, tell, I could keep you here for hours telling you stories about gangsters, you know? Unbelievable culture in these prisons. Un I, beyond belief, actually. So, yeah, they're very courageous. They're unbelievably courageous, some of them, you know? Yep. You have said many times that this is very difficult work and one has to be persistent and courageous. Yes. What is the hardest thing about this work? Changing your mind. Getting rid of anger. Stopping believing what you're seeing. Stopping believing that you're a creep. Stopping believing that person's really mean. Stopping believing that it really is that bad. Stopping believing the stories and the lies that our unhappy states of mind tell us that we are completely sucked into, that we think of as the truth. Does that make sense? That's what's hard. I mean, it's, it's, it, to make $100 million is easy in comparison with this job. But it's the one job that we don't do, nothing else is worthwhile. And it's the, it's, this is the emphasis of the Buddhist one, that our mind is ours, and no matter, how, it is possible. It's just that we're stuck in these ancient views, you know, that we believe as the truth. So it's, but, once you, but any job, it doesn't matter, even if you've got a map, as long as you've got the map, it doesn't matter if it's a million miles you have to walk. You know there's an end to it. You know there's, it, you're on a process. It's not hit and miss. You've got, the, you've got the technique and it's a question of applying it. That's what gives you courage and confidence and patience. 
Whereas we tend to think of spiritual practice as kind of like hit and miss. One day you feel all blissful, next day, oh my God, I want to kill myself again. And we don't think there's a method, you know. And I'm not being rude about the theistic religions. Please believe me, I'm an old Catholic, you know. That it's not our job as a Christian to de deconstruct Christ's views. I mean, I remember, what's his name? Who's that bloke who's got MS, who lives in a wheelchair? Stephen Hawking. Stephen Hawking. When he, read, he met the Pope, and the Pope thanked him for all his work up to the Big Bang. But he said, don't go further. That's not your job. That's God's job. Well, for the Buddha, it is our job. There's nothing sacrosanct. Being a Buddhist means getting our minds in touch with reality. It is our job to deconstruct this stuff. It is our job to see reality. It's our job, not anybody else's. But it's, and it's possible. Buddha says it's, it's innate within us, the capacity to do it. So you get courage from that. And long term, we all know practice makes perfect. It's not hit and miss. Yeah. Um, to come back to your practical instruction earlier, you were uh, speaking about positive and negative um, things that go on in our minds. Yes. Um, and I've always been wondering, um, you know, how, how do people decide what makes them happy and how do we figure out which column something should be in? There you go. Um, especially with something like the, that you could be self-deceived as an example, maybe alcohol, um, that sometimes it might be a positive thing and helps and, and, and you no, enjoy it right. and then it can exactly. become a negative thing or it could be a negative thing that you feel that's positive. That's exactly um, right. So how, how do you go about characterizing some of these more challenging um, well, thoughts? And into first of all, column? the object really isn't the point. It's, it is the point of the, of, of the attitude, as you're saying. So the key thing in understanding the Buddhist approach to it in this, in, this, in this little kind of model we're describing, when you look, first of all, establish that the characteristics of the positive minds are two. They are peaceful feeling. I don't mean gooey peaceful. I mean pleasant feeling, not paranoid, not miserable. They're kind of harmonious feeling, and they are in touch with reality in the sense that there's a sense of interdependence, which is how things exist. The negative qualities, and this is the point, are in their nature neurotic, fearful, and distorted in their view of how things are. So alcohol is not the issue. It's whether you're craving and attached to it. That is the one called attachment, which is this state of mind that its energy is neediness. It assumes an unhappy eye. It assumes an eye that needs something to fill it up, which then causes us to hanker after that object, which causes us to exaggerate the deliciousness of the object, which causes us to manipulate to get the object, which causes us to expect that we'll get happiness when we get the object. All of that is a characteristic of this neurotic state of mind called attachment. It's multifaceted. That's the cause of suffering, not the alcohol. So if you, have, if you don't have that, then you could have a taste of the alcohol, feel extremely blissful, and you'll put it down before you get out of control. There's no negativity there. That's positive. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. Yes, go. Oh, one more question. Okay. Time to go. One more question. Um. Yes. I, um, I am listening so carefully to how you describe this introspective lifestyle and um, this kind of relentless self-analysis and looking at the mechanisms for emotions and what you can do about them. That's right. Relentless and, and a good word. And I subscribe <laughs> to these okay. ideas. Why hang it on Buddhism? Um, it seems to me sure. that it could almost create noise to go with somebody else's words because... Also, say that part again. Don't, why, start that sentence from why hang it. Why hang it on Buddhism? What does that mean? Um, when you read somebody else's path and somebody else's set of ideas, yes. it, can get, it can be distorted once, once they've tried to describe it. And oh, you get away yes, from your, it in different ways. your right. own kind of organic way of yes. getting there can be disturbed, it seems to me. Okay. That's okay. Okay. Did you go to school? Did you learn math? Yes. Did you have a teacher who told you about one and one is two? Yes. Well then, you know all the rest of the question right here. How dare you go and get somebody else's knowledge? Why didn't you follow your own intuitive knowledge to come to what one and one is two is? I think you already know that's ridiculous. How stupid and arrogant of you to think, oh, I'm not going to listen to somebody else who's proved something to be true. I'm going to learn it myself. Sweetheart, if people have done it, why reinvent the wheel? But if you're the boss, you can read what Buddha says, you think about it. If you've got a few cute ideas that you think are useful, then you thank him, but then you make it your own knowledge. Whereas religion is believing it and trying to swallow it whole. Oh my God, that's a disaster. Your teacher doesn't ask you to believe what I'm telling you. She says, go check it out for yourself and then you make it your experience. So why not use the knowledge of, there's a nice word in Tibetan, Tenzin, Dalai Lama's name, knowledge holder. 
Sweetie, if I want to learn music, I would want to find a knowledge holder. I will then get them to help me find mine. Then I'll say goodbye to them because now I've got it. I think it's the most intelligent way to learn anything on this earth, from wiping your little bottom when you're a little girl, to tying your shoelaces, to learning how to be happy. Why not? What do you think? Um, I, I feel a little angry. I don't know if you're angry at me. Oh, darling, it's just how but I talk. I, um, Can't you see? <laughs> you can see my eyes. You'll see that we're smiling, sweetheart. Um, but I'm... I'm, how can I, I be angry I with wonder, you? Not possible. I wonder if there's a line there. I mean, um, a line of in course what, there's darling? teaching, but there's also um, getting thrown off course. Um, That's and, up and to you. You're the boss. The idea. That's up to you. You're the boss. There is bucket loads of information out there, isn't there? But you're the boss, darling. You're the boss. And I think I'm, it's true what you're saying. We have to look, sometimes when we suck in everything that everybody tells us, and that's what I'm hearing here, we've got to be extra cautious whom we listen to. We've got to really have the, the, the integrity to listen to ourselves, to trust our wisdom. You're absolutely right. So there is a line, dead right. Because some of us either swallow everything everybody else says whole, or we're so arrogant we think we have to reinvent the wheel. It's a, it definitely is a line between these two extremes. Definitely. And, yeah. and, and Buddhism is one of many, many different ideas. Um, Clearly. Yeah. Clearly. So, so choosing one seems... That's your um, business. Yeah. You decide exactly whom you want to listen to. You're, uh, you are the boss, not Buddha. He's just, like Einstein, just a messenger. He doesn't want you to believe in E equals MC squared, but he's telling you about it. He's telling you his findings and he'll tell you the implications of it. Then it's your call, darling. You see my point? Yeah, I understand. Thank you very Thank much. You. I understand yours too. And I can see your eyes are smiling, and so are mine. <laughs> Is that all? We're done? We're cooked, Tom? Well, I, I'm feeling pretty cooked. Okay. Uh, are you guys feeling cooked? Okay. Thank you so much for Thank coming. You. Um, I want to make a few quick announcements relevant to the topic of today's uh, talk. Um, one is that uh, soon there will be a meditation space, a dedicated meditation space opening in the new Alza buildings. Um, uh, we, we've worked hard on that for the last little while and, and it's finally come to fruition. Good. And Google is one of the first companies in the world to make that happen, so good for you and good for us. Um, second is that the Happiness and Its Causes conference oh, that yes. will be uh, uh, held to support the Liberation Prison Project. I should uh, do the commercial. Why don't you Let do me the do the commercial. Yeah. <laughs> I don't need the mic. Uh, Just uh, quick. I'll be like one second, okay? Okay. Yeah? Yeah, but, but you should use the mic because there are some folks... Uh, oh! Uh, you oh, you're mic'd. I'm sorry. I'm mic'd, right. yes. <laughs> I just... Yeah, okay. You know, one of the things, just quickly, that I've been... Over the years, since I've been doing this Buddhist stuff, you know, I've learned to really dislike the begging mentality. I can't stand this kind of non-profit begging, this entitlement and sitting there like a, kind of waiting for people to give you money. I mean, I like to be an entrepreneur, I think. So I become this sort of, I become like an entrepreneur in my old age. It's very funny being a Buddhist nun. This is the point for you. So I kind of thought, years ago I thought, well, what works in the West? It's called commerce. I mean, if you know, if you, I ask you for $5, you're going to be really reluctant to give it. But I've, if I give you a really delicious cake and coffee and then charge you seven and keep five, you don't mind at all. So my feeling is, we understand this in our culture, you know. We understand commerce really well. So you give people what they want and make them real happy, and I'm not being cynical, then they're very happy to give you their money. So we've got a little Buddhist book cafe out our centre, we've got all these kind of plans. And then last year I was in Sydney and my colleague there, Tony, thank you very much. <laughs> he's, uh, he's got his own company, like a half billion dollar company worldwide that runs conferences and he runs our centre in Sydney. So he started a couple of conferences there as a means of bringing in people. To, and bring in the dollars, of course, you know. And it's called, he started two. One is called happiness and its causes, and one is called mind and its potential. Well, you know, the, the one last year, Dalai Lama was one of the speakers, and I happened to be there too. And three and a half thousand people came, and he weighed $1.2 million for the centre. And I thought, oh, hell, I'm going to do this in San Francisco. <laughs> I thought, this is fantastic. Because you can't, you, people come to Buddhist centres, but like three and a half people come, you know. And they put maybe three dollars in the bowl, and you don't want to beg more from them. But you know, for these conferences, you can kind of charge more. And I'm not being cynical about it. So we've got this great conference, 40 people, some of the best brains, you know, psychology, philosophy. We've got musicians, we've got an artist, we've got a dancer, this gorgeous woman in New York who uses, she uses her own company to go into women's shelters using movement with w abused women and children. We've got a guy, Andre, who's a youth mentor, minority youth mentor in North Carolina, who goes into prisons there for us. His son was murdered in January. 
and he's in tears of compassion for, the, for this boy who killed his son, you know. He's going to be talking to Pam Moore, who's on Cron 4, I think, in San Francisco, talking about forgiveness and how we all need to forgive. We've got, a, you know, a, a singer talking about things. We've got philosophers, psychologists. We've got a Ross Mercurimi, the, the green politician guy in San Francisco. A great group of people over two days and lots of con and workshops as well, as well as an amazing concert. We did a, we got a commissioned a Guatemalan composer to write a piece for us, which we're going to use to do a fundraiser. Monica here. She left Google and came and worked for me. I stole her from you. <laughs> She's going to organize the concert for us. So it's at the Western in San Francisco. It's about, we want a thousand people. It's, I don't know, 500 bucks, but if a bunch of you come, you get a big fat discount. But it, your, Meng is coming. I think it's just great. I'm really happy with it. And we've got ads on the back of buses in San Francisco. We've got 60,000 cards dropped to 2,000 drops in LA. We've got things on the bark. They're coming up in a minute. We've got iPods and what do you call them? No, podcasts, uh, Twitter, YouTube, <laughs> Facebook, I, Uspace, whatever they're called. <laughs> All of them. We've got the lot, you know, trying to get the people to come. So that's the conference. So please come. Okay. 24, 25 November, the days before Thanksgiving. But it, you've got ads around here, I think. And there's, but check happinesssf.com. That's a shortcut to the site. Happiness happinesssf. No, happinesssf.com gets you there. That's on the one on the back of the buses. <laughs> okay. Thank you. That's my commercial. Thank you.